yeah, thanks for having us and thanks to uh, come and uh, to listen to us. We as artists uh, used to talk about our work, so <laughs> this is what we're going to do. And uh, we start with uh, the Nefertiti egg and give you some backgrounds and show some visuals and uh, tell you about some anecdotes um, which happened on the way. And um, then in, in the end we will talk a bit about our current project which uh, deals with dinosaurs and uh, yeah, maybe we're gonna show uh, first a video so you get a wrap up of uh, the content so we don't have to talk too much. <laughs> now there's a German equivalent of the Elgin marbles. It's the bust of the Egyptian queen Nefertiti which sits in a museum in Berlin rather than in the vicinity of its creator. So the bust of Queen Nefertiti is a 3000 year old work of art that was found in Egypt by German archeologists in 1912 who discovered the house and the workshop of the sculptor, a man named Thutmose. Currently, it's in a museum in Berlin with limited access to the public. Basically, there are no photos allowed. And for years, Germany and Egypt have fought over its rightful location, and the officials even claim that she was illegally stolen. Now, the Egyptians would love to have that bus back, but the Germans have guarded it jealously, even banning photographs. So it is pretty amazing that two artists have succeeded in taking a full 3D scan of the bust, here they are, secretly scanning back in October last year. So two artists secretly 3D scan the bust and release the files to the public as a free download. Although museums have already scanned Nefertiti's bust, they actually don't plan to make it public, which seems kind of backwards because there's a lot of museums around the world that are hosting scanathons. That's where they let people use their smartphones to take a bunch of pictures of things, objects, and to make 3D scans of them. Now, it sounds a bit like Ocean's Eleven or one of these movies. What I don't understand is, I mean, th this thing is obviously guarded, right? And you must have been there for, what, a few hours? And yes. how did you not get caught? I mean, what were you, how did you disguise yourself? This is like pirate 3D printing, folks. So we thought we would download the file and 3D print it ourselves on our 3D printer. We're amazed just how much detail was captured in the model. I mean, every little crack, chip, and scratch is fully visible, which is no surprise because the mesh has a whopping 9 million polygons. It's so detailed that if you throw it in your slicing software, it'll probably crash. Yeah, and um, we brought to you the data as well. Like, here you can find the data if you're interested. This is about uh, 8 million polygons, as the dude in, uh, on TV was mentioning. Actually, it was really nice because in, in before the project and when uh, Axioma mentioned or, or was uh, announcing the, um, this exhibition, there were like a fab lab nearby who downloaded the data and you can see the, one of the remixes uh, over there in the entrance room. And um, yeah, this is nice. And this is what happened a lot to us um, or to the data. It really got relevant and a lot of people downloaded it and uh, give relevance to, to this data. Because this data, special about it, the museum, Neues Museum in Berlin, obtained this data or scanned the bust uh, eight years ago and didn't publish the data. So they got hold on it and they fulfilled their role as a goalkeeper, a gatekeeper for their assets or their commodities, if you want. And um, we felt that we Need, there, there's a need to reclaim uh, public museums uh, by the public and by citizens or artists as, as we consider ourselves. And so we decided to scan the bust. And, um, but not only release the data set on the biggest hacker convention uh, in Germany, the CCC Congress uh, on a public domain, but also beforehand we um, produced a high-detailed high 3D print and uh, brought this to Egypt um, and exhibited the bust for the first time in Egypt um, as a country or at least the, the, the region of origin uh, of this um, artifact. Oh, this is like Berlin. If you haven't been visiting this museum, um, how the bust is actually staged in the museum, kind of what we always like to call sacred staging because the bust has its own room and uh, yeah, as uh, you all now know there is no photographs allowed but in the rest of the museum photographs are allowed and so on so it's a special room. 
along the way or even beforehand, we ask ourselves why museums or, as in, in this case, German public museums are so um, keen about to keep it close and keep their data for themselves and not sharing it. And we came across two reasonable reasons, you can say this. Um, one is an economic reason, because they made, they made around 1.6 uh, million euros um, by licensing their assets and their data. Uh, this, was, uh, this is a number from four years ago. And um, the other reason is the uh, interpretorial um, sovereignty. So if you possess these objects and you possess even the data, then you tell the story about the data. So, and our aim is to open up this discussion because the story which is told by the museum, it's a fictionalized story as well. They pretend to be uh, strict science, but it isn't because it's, inter it, it's an interpretation. So any interpretation is somehow fictional or a simulacrum. The press mentioned us like an act of clear defiance to the uh, order of the museums or um, they called us the Robin Hoods of <laughs> antiquities or um, they, the most ethical thieves the most ethical art taste, and then they came across that you can't scan such a high detailed 3D scan with a Kinect. Because if you have a bit, if you have knowledge about 3D scanning, a Kinect is not, uh, it's not feasible, it's not uh, possible to scan such a data set. So they came across that this can't be the whole truth about it and they called it afterwards a hoax. And uh, the New York Times had to uh, bring a second article because there were like these kind of truthers in the internet or trolls. They came out that this is not truth. And, um, but the, the good thing about this, it's not about if we pretended to do something which we didn't do, but it uh, provoked a discussion widely um, in, in a wider field than only people interested in museums or high culture or archaeology, but also people from the 3D printing or the DIY sector and uh, technicians, hackers, uh, people like you and me at least, to bring up this discussion, because it's not a discussion which should be discussed in, in some back rooms of museums or some board meetings. It should be discussed by the public and by all of us. These are some of the... Um, the remixes, this is an um, important part of the, of the work and you can see later on a video on this a little funny tablet on the wall. Because this, as in the beginning I mentioned, this g gained a lot of attention by, by the people to, to have access to this kind of data. Uh, data and um, people like to, to remix. And this remix culture uh, brings up the question of originality. As we exhibited the bust, we exhibited the bust without the colonial patina, without painting. We think the, the copy is not anymore a slave of the original, but it was an emancipatory act to, to free the data and free the, the form itself. And uh, so it, it, it makes possible to tell new stories about it. Maybe, <laughs> maybe one more anecdote about the uh, institutional angst or why museums fear um, that but uh, why not putting the data on a public domain and giving access for the public? Here you can see those remixes, later you see more. And um, there was a, another case that was not in the um, case of Nefertiti, but uh, um, another sculpture which was scanned by a student which was um, outside in, in the public um, in a garden at a university. It was already a copy. And then the student put it on a public domain and it got also remixed. And, um, the museum in Italy, which uh, has the original, was saying they have to um, delete all these remixes because they are such bad taste. So it's really it's a question about uh, aesthetics in the end and about like what uh, the identity of the those museums <laughs> and what they actually want to preserve. And I mean, yeah, some people would call it bad taste. I don't know, probably. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the museums are facing, by digitization, they're facing a lot of change, but change is the only uh, constant in life now. So, um, but by this, they, the, there comes the institutional angst as well from, because they don't know how to, to 
digitalize their whole collections. And what, what we observed that the aim is always to scan the whole, uh, the entire collection and not only single objects and make a good story out of it, which would be a possible too and do it step by step, but, um, but to scan the whole thing and um, this, this uh, derives from an, from an um, old mindset, we would say. A conservative mindset. Yeah. These, are, these are little anecdotes when, when we uh, flew out, because we, ha we had to bring in not only the 3D print, because we had a little <coughs> small hoax uh, plant in Egypt as well. So we bought in such a uh, copy, but uh, 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 a plaster cast. And this is the plaster cast. It looks like if you pass the security uh, check <laughs> at the airport. But this was a painted one, and uh, our plan was to, to stage a video um, which refers to a lot of looting videos, um, which are in the internet and in YouTube, and these are put by, by looters or grave diggers, or however you're going to call them, um, to, to sell. They use YouTube as an eBay or as a platform to offer their, their assets. And this is the video we shot um, in the desert in an actually ancient site. We got consulted by one of the most outspoken archaeologists from Egypt. And she's one of the strongholds in fighting against this looting. Because you have to consider looting is the, world, uh, the third biggest illegal market after arms and weapons and drugs. And she was, in the end, the person who launched this video then on her Twitter account and, oh, look what I found. And then it uh, created a dis discussion over there and the Ministry of Antiquities in Egypt was saying, um, this can't be true. And, but it provoked the idea what would be if there is a second bust fine, because it's not unlikely the, the sculptor of this bust back 3,000 years ago um, it was found in a workshop, and archaeologists um, speculate about that this, is, uh, this was meant to be a mass production and not only a singular object. Um, so it wouldn't be unlikely to find the second Nefertiti. And then a lot of questions arise. What happens to the value to Nefertiti, which is estimated around 40 million euros, 40 billion euros, million? million. million. And, um, it's an absurd number, but then it would be split and each of them would be 20 or like this kind of questions. Like we have a pixeled version of the, uh, uh, how it looks in the Neues Museum and we reconstructed the, the structure. This is, this is bulletproof glass um, and you can't reach her. This, we call it sacred staging and uh, a lot of, a lot of, this is a lot about the politics of representation of other cultures and obtaining, possessing, literally possessing other cultures and then create these narratives around them and um, the, the whole idea of otherness. What we were looking at uh, in this project and also in the next project, but it's then about natural history museums, obviously, um, is that uh, cultural institutions and museums are power structures and like Nikolai already said a little bit, um, that it's about Possessing material objects from other cultures is like possessing those cultures in quite a literal way. And uh, today, I mean, this is like following Baudrillard's thoughts maybe more, but you can sense this notion totally until today in Berlin. We have a huge debate on the planned Humboldt Forum, which is uh, the biggest museum, public museum project in Europe since the past, I don't know how many decades. That's how it is advertised, and um, it's going to inhabit the whole um, ethnographic collection. So actually, there's not a big difference between fossils, um, ancient art, man-made artifacts, and uh, ethnographic collections um, in the end, of course. And I think um, this is uh, the problem with the digitization, or it's actually not a problem, it's a chance, but um, is that Museums apply their role similarly and even fear, that's at least what, what we encountered, fear um, of losing their relevance. But we, we never saw it as a competition between the original or um, the copy, on the contrary. And um, I mean, the, the mission of museums is always stated as making knowledge and making the artifacts um, as accessible as possible and of course the Berlin Museum always 
is saying that everyone can come and visit the museum, but that's of course not true. Not everyone can come to Berlin, not everyone can pay the more than 10 euros um, entrance fee and so on and so forth. So this is some, some illusionary thought um, we always also like to mention. And we haven't really talked about um, why we call this work the other Nefertiti, just very briefly, um, otherness, and we refer to um, Edward Said uh, and his Orientalism. Uh, in, um, and it, what he says is that representing the other, and in that case, it's the ancient uh, Egyptian culture, that it's always a violent act to do that. And if you actually talk to um, curators or to um, representatives of the museums, then they, this was at least what the archaeologist, this, she's the, Dr. Monica Hanna in Cairo, uh, from the American University. What she said, uh, she always sees that those collections are um, uh, presented as being from dead civilizations. I really, uh, we had to th think a lot about this because um, of course those objects are completely decontextualized and through this they might become dead objects as well. But um, we talk about um, the questions of restitution, like one of the first questions we always got is do you think the Nefertiti then should go back to Egypt? And that's what we actually did in the end. We, we exhibited the copy there. But then we also uh, don't like to talk too much about restitution because it's like a dualism and it's based uh, on the idea of nation states. And we don't think necessarily, actually on the contrary, that nation states are the rightful owners um, of those objects at all. And that needs to be discussed uh, and it's not something and even that those collections are inherently political and if and that's not uh, acknowledged from the museums that's not made visible like all the colonial entanglement you find um, especially in german museums it's really just a few sentences about that violent past and presence and acts which are part of the their collections the problem is that mm, the museums not have a kind of supremacist point of view in, in this um, argument because they say only them have the capacity to safeguard and preserve those objects. They couldn't give the bus back or all the other artifacts back to Egypt, for example, because they don't have the capacity. But then again, it's, uh, it's like um, we don't like to talk about restitution for that reason because we don't want to talk about dead objects, but we want to talk about living societies, um, how they relate today to those objects. And this is, I think, what needs to be discussed. Uh, Egyptians, Egyptians today, how they relate to this, Berliners, how they relate um, to the Nefertiti. And then we can see um, how we can work it out. What we did in the end um, was, uh, this shows uh, is, uh, a film still from the video we will show later here. Um, because we don't believe in this uh, kind of um, possession or ownership of those objects, um, in Egypt we were actually asked, not officially, but uh, it was an opportunity to give the 3D print to the um, Ministry of Culture. Uh, and we thought about it briefly and thought this doesn't feel right. And also our plan was to go um, to the desert, and that's what we did in the end, and to bury the 3D print in the desert to have a potential techno heritage which can, which can be found at one point or maybe not or never and, and to work with a desert as a space um, where it was found and as a counteract to excavations like what we are used to do in our Western societies. And maybe just very briefly um, how the institution actually reacted to our project. Um, it's kind of interesting because uh, in the beginning they didn't react at all after we published the data on the um, Hacker Congress. But then already it started that the data spread and there were thousands of um, remixes all over the place in the online. Uh, and there was like coverage in Germany, a little bit about it, and in Europe probably. And they just reacted when the New York Times made the article about it and called them and said, you want to make a statement for the article or you don't want to do it. And of course then they wanted to do it. But they just said they are not amused about our act and they might sue us um, for this. As we said in the beginning, it's, it's about um, a valid amount of money also, and it's about commodification of um, the object, which is part of the problem, and which we encountered a lot as an argument by museums why they are not opening up their collections, because due to a lack of funding, that's what they say. They rely on their licenses. They rely on the visitors coming, paying those high entry fees. 
So I think this is a more like, it's a real argument for sure. So I think our societies need to talk about that. Like how, what is the value of making like cultural objects as commons and on a, putting them on a public domain. But also there were of course a lot of other museums which were um, amazed, which even invited us to talk about it and which tried to uh, yeah, be as open with their collections as possible. That was for example the Statens Museum in Copenhagen or the VNA Martin Roth um, or in the US the um, <coughs> Met, Met collection they mm -hmm. opened everything so they are also really good examples but especially Germany is very conservative that's what we can say for sure and yeah maybe to close um, uh, about the Nefertiti at least to close um, briefly this is um, yeah an amazing thinker from um, Cameroon and he's teaching in South Africa in Johannesburg and uh, thinks a lot about uh, museums as well and after all this um, arguments and dialogues we had uh, in the aftermath of the pro uh, project um, we, we like to see museums more um, as a process and as like um, a space of constant negotiation and uh, of course we like to see museums um, to have an ethical compass or moral compass even and this is um, definitely in not <laughs> happening in the moment and of, yeah, what we try with um, technology is, is to figure out the emancipatory potential here to go beyond the canon and to see the perspective of the digital as a social practice and a cultural technique. And I think this, yeah. We're going to talk briefly about the next project. This is here, that's a film still from uh, Tendaguru. Tendaguru is in South Tanzania, 100 years back. It was a German colony called uh, German East Africa. And um, German colonizers shortly after the uh, bloody Maji Maji war, which was one of the bloodiest colonial wars uh, fought in Africa, the most East African tribes, they reunited to fight against the German uh, oppressors short before the, the First World War. And Germany was looking for uh, resources for their weapon production. But instead of finding these uh, resources, they found uh, dinosaur bones. They pretend they found these dinosaur bones. But actually the community living there at this place in Tendaguru, they had lived for, with these fossils for centuries. So they had rituals, they had healing purposes, and they had uh, uh, spiritual rituals, weather, weather dance rituals, all of this uh, kind of, they, they had a relation and it was a kind of a sacred place for them. So um, what happened then, 230 tons of fossilized bones got um, extracted from the earth and got uh, displaced to uh, the Berlin Natural History Museum. This is a Berlin History Museum, so this is Nora uh, and me carrying away one of the biggest bones, the, the femur bone of, of the biggest dinosaur. It's one of the biggest dinosaurs ever found on earth. Um, Brachiosaurus pranca it's called. And of course it's a replica, but it's not important because the image works uh, like this. So we, we provoke this discussion. This, it, it starts by telling a narrative which is not true. They didn't found the bones. So we pretend now to have found the data of the dinosaur again, like similar to the Nefertiti case, but different. And um, from there on, we, we, we started to, to work with the data and ask an AI how dinosaur would look like if they didn't got extinct. And um, by applying generative algorithms, it optimizes the structure of the bone and you have millions of iterations. But back to Tendaguru, we went there, we talked to the people, we managed to find actually the community which, is, uh, which their grandfathers were involved in these or in these colonial entanglements and were forced to carry the, the bones away like 60 kilometers through the bush. And they are really clear and aware that Germany or this institution is profiting from, which belongs somehow to them. 
because <laughs> it got extracted from there and got displaced. So they are not profiting at all. They want to profit. They commissioned us after asking, what do you do here? But then <laughs> um, after several weeks of, of meeting again and talking, they commissioned us to, to build in somehow a kind of museum or somehow uh, some, something which they can profit from. And so uh, we, in a collective process, we, we decided to, to make a, a virtual museum. But this is upcoming. This is now, we are, we are right now in the process. We launched this project uh, one month ago in the last exhibition. And um, we will be working on this for the next year. Yeah. And just to add briefly before we show, before we finish actually, and to sh uh, show you another quick uh, film about this, the next project and why we also choose dinosaurs and what is so interesting about that as a speculative material. I think what is important in this case, we, we tried to collaborate with the museum or we at least uh, approached the museum and told them we want to um, engage with your collection. Can we have access to the archives, to data? to any knowledge and uh, that was denied in a very harsh way and uh, so that's like the backstory that's also why it is actually again kind of impossible that we again obtain data from that bone and how can we have that uh, copy of this femur so um, uh, but the context is like um, what we always uh, yeah like to add to this it's not uh, talking about the colonial past or something um, this, this area we talk about and where we are going to build this museum in a virtual and aug augmented uh, way is, um, is today um, what happens there is that a consortium um, from multinationals uh, through a World Bank project, they took um, a land in the size of Italy in southern Tanzania to extract resources again. And this is like we see it as a direct um, colonial continuity. So it's nothing of the past, and the past has implications until today and for the future. And it's very important for these people, when we, when we are doing this mu museum, in that process is that we are going to change the law of the um, soil, of the, uh, of the place itself, to, yeah, of the territory, to a natural forest yeah. reserve. So it can't be obtained actually um, by multinationals, for example, and so it is self-managed uh, by the people who live there. So it's, it has various dimensions, but um, the dinosaur uh, dimension is also the fun part, so we don't want to yeah, skip that. <laughs> And we worked with different uh, scientists and researchers and professors. The first voice you will hear is uh, W.J.T. Mitchell, the author of the last dinosaur book. Uh, and the founder of the cultural studies and the pictorial turn. The dinosaur really symbolizes the reality of the extinction of species. Uh, the idea that 90% of the things that have lived on this planet are no longer around. You, know, you can't find them except through paleontology, which tries to reconstruct what is lost. But the dinosaur is the figurehead of that whole uh, story, the modern scientific story of extinction. One is not interested in the fossil as object. One is less interested in that and one is interested in the fossil as a discourse, as a way of knowing, and as a way of understanding society and, and, and the world. This practice, this belief that the Indians can tell you about what they think about rain, what they think about the sky, what they think about natural phenomena in the earth, but no matter how much information they have, they cannot tell you about the thing itself. It, all the information that they have can only tell you about how the Indians think about rain, how the Indians think about the sky, how they think about the buffalo. It cannot tell you about the buffalo. It cannot tell you about the sky. They cannot tell you about dinosaurs. This was Danny Gayton, a researcher from Standing Rock. It really has to do with not just I am going to die, everybody recognizes that, you know, I'm not forever, but 
all, it, all of my people, my kind, the human race itself, could disappear, could go the way of the dinosaurs. And that is, you know, it's hard to grasp what that would mean. Uh, so that's why I think they are deeply mysterious, because they were world dominant, like we are world dominant. That's why I think. My fundamental premise was dinosaurs are us. What is the task of the museum? What do you do? How, how, how do you have to reorientate yourself? Ujio wa hapa, unahusiana na mifupa iliyotolewa Tendaguru na kupelekwa Germany. Kwa jina naitwa Mohamed Yari na ni mzaliwa wa kijiji cha Nyangala. Kero yangu kubwa ni kutokana na sifa ya huu mlima na sifa ya huu mnyama. Tofauti na mazingira jinsi yalivyo. Ukiangalia miondo mbinu hamna eh na pili tunateseka kama hivi na hakuna tunachokipata na wazungu wanakuja wanaangalia mazingira yalivyo na tunawafikishia mpaka huko kama hivi tulivyowafikishia. Hapa ninapoongea nipo juu ya mlima. Lakini mazingira njia yenyewe yaelezishi tumekuja jana tumetoka asubuhi tunafika leo hivi na mama tumelala njiani. Kwa mazingira ya ya huu mlima jinsi ulivyo na sifa yake tofauti na njia ilivyo. Pili kila kijiji kina sanati. Eh? Vitu vingi hamna pale tunakosa lakini kutokana na uchumi ulivyoshuka. Kwa hivyo sisi tunaomba tu haya mazingira tutengenezee kiwezekana na sisi tuliyo tunufaike na haya mazingira. Na huyu mnyama na sisi tunufaike naye, tuwe na faida naye. Lakini mpaka sasa hivi hatuna faida naye. Ameondoka tangia alipoondoka mpaka la hivi, amekuja kumchukua, hatuna faida yote. Kwa hiyo mikilango ndio hiyo hapa. Nimaliza. So you, you might ask yourself why we didn't translate the last part and uh, this has a reason. It's quite smart what he's saying, but we decided not to we have the translation, but not to put it um, because for us, we are constantly challenging ourselves not to step into these colonial continuities and uh, make this self, uh, we call it cultural fracking, in a, in a way like we obtain uh, material, video material, information, indigenous narratives, and then sell it to invest in art market, which a lot of fellow artists are doing. Not mentioning them, but uh, for us, we try to achieve uh, a an, an more sincere approach towards this. Yeah, to come back to this room and to uh, the, the other Nefertiti uh, project, um, there is uh, today we are launching the Nefertiti bot, and it's over there in the corner. And uh, it's still a beta version, so it's not uh, running perfectly, but you can try to speak to, speak to Nefertiti and uh, this has, of course, uh, I don't know, different um, background ideas. And of course, it's about um, questioning the interpretation of sovereignty, not only of museums, but of their few experts who are at the moment writing object biographies and to make objects speak. And it's also like we, because we thought a lot about um, the agency of inanimate things. And uh, this is our questions actually inside the bot as well which is um, based on an open source technology. It's uh, suzy.ai. You can also find it online. And um, so the bot was trained by us, but it goes beyond our training as well. And um, we want to see how, um, what happens when those objects have their own voices. And um, yeah, to go yeah, to beyond the human-centered approach we have so far about those collections, I guess. So thank you very much. <laughs>